Welcome to the video. If you're new here, my name is Chris and I build productivity apps. I usually focus on one productivity app per video. So today we're focusing on Ellie. Quick context, Ellie is a daily planning app. It's basically your to-do list and calendar combined. So that's the app that we're gonna be talking about today. So a common question I get is, what is your design process? So I thought I'd make a quick video outlining what my design process is. And I actually have the perfect feature that I think would showcase what that looks like in practice. So I'll walk you guys through the process and I'll show you guys how we got from this screen to this screen by the end of the video. So the feature we're gonna talk about is search for the iOS Ellie app, but before we get into it, let me talk about my process at a high level. So I do wanna mention that the process changes a little bit depending on the feature I'm working on, but on the whole, these are the steps that I usually take for most of the features. So the first step in my process is mood boarding and finding good examples. And this is basically where I find a bunch of good examples all over the internet using some tools, which we'll talk about in the video, and I put them on a Figma board just so at a high level I can see what are other people doing, what options I have, and just try to get some inspiration for where I wanna take the design of the feature. Feature. Even if the feature is super simple and pretty straightforward, like I already have a pretty clear vision of what I'm gonna do here, I usually find that the process is still worth going through because maybe you find something you never would have thought of or you get inspired and decide to go in a completely different direction. You basically have nothing to lose by doing this. So regardless of how small or big the feature is, I always do this step first. So once the mood board's done, the second step is I try to prototype a bunch of options in Figma. If there's only one option, sometimes I skip the prototyping in Figma and do it directly in code. But if I have more than one option, I like to do it in Figma so I can see the options side by by side and compare. The third step in my process is once I have a bunch of prototypes laid out, I pick the best prototype out of all the options and then I implement it directly in code so I can test it on a real device with real data. And the reason I wanna test it on a real device is I wanna test the UX or the user experience. Figma is great to be able to see the UI and see how it looks, but, but I found if you really wanna test the UX, you need to do it on a real device so you can actually simulate what it's gonna be like in the real world for users. And I try really hard to test it with real data because sometimes fake data makes everything look really good. There are so many designs that I've seen that look amazing because they have really good high quality images or specific text that just fit the screen and look really good. But then in production with real data and lower quality images, it just doesn't look as good. So I try to test it with my own data or as real data as possible, just so I can catch some UX problems that the really good fake data was hiding. And this actually was the case, as you'll see later in the video, the results were actually a little different once we started using real data, but we'll talk about that later in the video. And the final step is to just iterate on the design. Now that it's on my device, I'll be able to get a good feel for it and I usually have a ton of ideas and a bunch of things that I would change once I'm actually using it. But this is what takes the majority of the time for my design process. It's this constant iteration and refining. This is the high level. These are the four steps of my design process. So let's actually jump into the features so you guys can see what this looks like in practice. So the feature that we're working on is search for the mobile app. Also my girlfriend Cecilia is a designer and she wanted some practice. Thought it'd be fun to work on this with her so huge shout out to her for helping me with this one. So the first thing that we did was the mood boarding and finding good examples. I get inspiration all over the internet but the primary primary tool I use to find examples is something called Mobbin. If you've been watching my channel, you know I use Mobbin, you know I talk about them all the time. I'm really excited to be able to say that they actually sponsored this video, so huge shout out to them. I'm gonna leave a link in the description if you're interested in trying them, but even if they weren't sponsoring, they're the tool that I've been using this entire time to get inspiration. And it's basically a huge design library with screenshots and flows from other applications. So in this case, we're looking to build search. So we hopped on Mobbin, we searched for search, and we found all of these different amazing screenshots on how other apps implement search. So we copied the ones we were the most drawn to, threw them on a Figma board, and this is the mood board that we came up with. I'll walk through this a little bit and show you some of the screens that we like. I really liked how this screen laid it out. It's super clean. I love the icons on the left. It adds a little bit of breathing room to something that's usually more text heavy. I really like how this screen, which I think is craft, groups the search results. I like the filtering at the top for this app. I really like how Airbnb uses cards to break things up here. I really like how the search results are highlighted in this app. A lot of really good options and all of this stuff comes from Mobbin. So once we had the mood board done and we found a bunch of directions that we wanted to go, Cecilia started working on a couple prototypes while I spent some time porting over the functionality. From a technical standpoint, this was super easy. I'm using a service called TypeSense, and that's with powering the search on the web and desktop version. So I was able to take a lot of the code there, a lot of the backend and the APIs, just throw it onto the iOS version. So that took about like two to three hours to port over. And by the time I was done porting this over and it didn't look good, but it was functioning, she had the prototypes ready to go. So the first prototype was this concept where the results are inside of a card and the card looked really cool. But once I physically saw it here mocked up, I realized it kind of added some unnecessary depth to the app. Usually depth is added to highlight or elevate some things. For example, if we added depth to the search bar, it would make that more prominent in the UI. But in this case, the depth being added to the search results didn't really add anything in my opinion. So I know we got this inspiration from this mockup from Airbnb, but it makes a lot more sense for them because they have this map in the background. So they kind of want to 
show this and let things float over it. But since we just have a white screen in the back and we don't really have anything behind it, it felt a little bit unnecessary. So we decided to not go with that option. So another concept was grouping the results by type. So if the matches are from the task title, they'd be grouped here. If they're from the notes, they'll be grouped here. That made a lot of sense. And from a UI perspective, it really did feel like this would make the design a little bit more clean. But one of the issues with this when we thought about it a little more is the way that my backend and type sense, which is the service I'm using for search, they return the results and it's ranked by relevancy. So the order actually matters. If we group things, I realize it would actually impact that order. Let me show you guys an example. In the ungrouped version, it could appear as the second result. However, in the grouped version, it appears as result number four. So because there would be an actual impact on functionality, I tried not to go with the grouping option either. And the last concept that we tried was a more traditional search list that you see in a bunch of different other apps. It is a little bit more boring compared to the first two, but I felt like it had the best UX out of all the three options and probably a reason why a ton of other apps do it this way too. So between the three prototypes, this is the one we felt like was the best option. And we went for the next step, which was implementing the prototype so I can use it on a real device with real data. So once I implemented the designs, I started noticing a few things. So the first thing was I completely forgot to implement the ability to search by subtask. I don't even support the functionality yet on the desktop version, but rather than implement it for now, which I realized would be actually a bigger technical lift than I anticipated, we decided to just completely remove that functionality from the designs. So for now, users can just search through task title and the notes. There were a few side effects that came from this. We did have the filtering at the top, so you can choose to only search by task title or only search by subtask. But now that we remove subtasks and there's really only two things to filter on, I noticed in my usage, I wasn't using the filtering at the top anymore. So I decided to just remove that for now. I think I will re-add it once I do bring back subtask searching, but for now, just removing it because I felt like it wasn't that helpful. Something good that did come out of it though by accident was I noticed that for the empty state, when there are no results displayed, the screen did look a little bit unbalanced with the filtering at the top. By removing that, I felt like this empty state did look a little bit more balanced. So that was a pretty good side effect that came from removing those filtering chips. The next thing I noticed was the icons on the left side, which indicated what type of match the result had. So for example, this one showed there's a match on the note. There's a match on these subtasks. It was really good in theory, but when I was using it, it didn't really seem that helpful. I was kind of just ignoring the icons every time I ran a search. So we decided to cut it because my philosophy is if something isn't adding to the experience, it's best to just remove it so it reduces cognitive load on the users. But then removing it, the design felt super text heavy and I really loved how in these mockups, there are icons on the left because it does break up the text a little bit and make it a little bit more breathable. So we did try to brainstorm something to replace those icons. Luckily, we realized we forgot to add the complete and incomplete indicators on the task, like the literal checkbox that shows that a task was complete. Maybe we can just put those there. And when we tried that, I actually feel like the UX improved a little bit because it made searching for incomplete tasks a little bit easier. It's just easier to scan and see, oh, these ones are incomplete. So that was an unintended side effect that came out of that where I feel like the UX actually improved. For some reason, we just didn't think about doing this in the original design. So that was a pretty cool thing that happened. So on that note of looking for things to cut and simplifying the UI, I was trying to look for more things that weren't that necessary for me or I was ignoring. And one of the things I noticed is there's a couple of indicators on the task that I didn't feel like were relevant during the search process. One example is this indicator on the task shows how much time was spent on the task. This is really relevant on certain screens like the task list screen. As I was searching and I was trying to put myself in the user's shoes, I felt like that task indicator wasn't that relevant to the search. So for now we cut all the indicators except for label, subtask, and note. And I feel like that would cover most of what people are gonna be looking for when conducting a search. If people ask to bring back the indicators, I'll reconsider it. But for now, we cut it just to keep things simple. The next thing I noticed was the highlighting was pretty good where it bolds the text and makes it the color purple, which is the primary color of the app. But I felt like it could be a little stronger and maybe there was a way to make this a little bit more scannable. So I remember seeing this example on the mood board and I really liked how they do highlighting. I felt like my eyes could more quickly scan for highlights in this version. So we tried a couple variations of this. Here were two more variations we came up with. Between the three options, we were really torn on which one to choose. So I decided to throw a quick poll on Twitter to see which one people preferred. And I want you to pause the video and try to figure out which one you think won the poll. So the one that won was the one with the yellow background. I can't definitively say why that won the poll, but I think people just associate yellow with highlighting, so maybe it was a little bit easier to scan. But regardless, because people chose this and we were already 50-50 on this one, we decided to roll with the yellow highlighting. So these are the major things, but there were a couple of minor things, and I wanted to point a couple of them out just to show you guys what level of detail we were going here. So one thing was playing with the height and size of the search box, trying to figure out what shade of gray the dividers between each of the results would be. Not really covered in the Figma, but what haptics we should add here. So there's a little vibration or haptic when you clear the search box or when you click on a search result. A little tweak where when the user navigates to the search page, the keyboard automatically opens up. And it looks really different from the original prototype that we started out with. All of these things, all of these iterations, they contributed from going from this 
to this. I hope this was interesting to see a little bit more behind the scenes of my design process. Huge shout out to Cecilia for helping me with this one. I'll leave a link to her portfolio if you wanna go check that out. If you like this kind of content, check out my Instagram and TikTok. I post almost every other day about building productivity apps. And obviously if you like this content, don't forget to subscribe. But thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.